welcome you all today here at Masjid. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We need to use the restrooms. It's going to be for the men. It's going to be.
a law is knowing and acquainting. Thank you, Zam. Can we go to Justin Bieber joke? <laughs> no? <laughs> Alright, so um, on behalf of the board, staff, volunteers, and community, I'd like to again thank you uh, and welcome all of you for attending our event. In such an unprecedented and extraordinary time in our country's history, we are seeing and experiencing some deeply rooted issues that have arisen to take center stage in all of our lives. Whether we want to accept it or not, we are all in it together. We are also a people and country that are resilient. We are a people that are always up for the challenge. And we are a people that will always create bridges of transparency and understanding. You see, you and I are part of a very unprecedented event. And I am staring at some extraordinary people. People who have looked past all of the noise and all of the hate and have taken the mammoth step of creating an air of understanding and love. Thank you. I told myself I wouldn't cry. So take a moment and look around the room. You are all a part of various beliefs, ideologies, backgrounds, cultures, and occupations. In this room right now, we have friends, neighbors, families, general supporters, religious congregations and parishes, pastors, deacons, local government officials from Streamwood, Schomburg, Hoffman, Roselle, uh, Hanover Park, uh, you name it. Uh, and we also have a lot of mayors, fire chiefs, police chiefs, trustees, village managers, and the like, state government officials and employees, community leaders, and definitely last but not least, someone who is very dear to my heart, because I'm married to one, educators and teachers, principals, superintendents, administration staff, social workers. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming out here. so humbling and we are all grateful to God first and foremost for having you all support us and more importantly give us a chance to build understanding. We are truly indebted to you all. And now to walk us through the agenda, I'd like to call on one of our community members, Saima Ahmad, who will walk you through the agenda and welcome our first speaker for the day. Thank you. Hello everyone. I'd like to give everyone a rundown of our agenda. We have a great presentation on some of the basics of Islam as well as some misconceptions. After the presentation, we will have Q&A and after Q&A, we will have some of our concluding remarks. We'd like you all to stay and observe our second communal prayer of the day. It's definitely a must-see, as some of you have asked me about the prayer. At this point, I'd like to ask Dr. Sabil Ahmed of Gain Peace, an organization founded on promoting understanding and communication, to give his presentation. He has been doing this for 25 years, and I'm proud to say that this is the largest group he has ever addressed. That says a lot about you all and about our community. I start in the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful, and welcome and greet all of you with the Islamic greeting of Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. That means, may God's peace, mercy, and blessings be upon each single one of you. And some of you who are from the Christian background would be surprised to find out 
that Jesus, who we believe to be as a prophet, it says in the New Testament, chapter 20 of John, verse number 19, as soon as Jesus went to the upper chamber to meet his disciples, the very first thing that he mentioned to them was, peace be upon you. So that's how we meet and greet each other with the greeting of peace. Now, I have a short presentation by the way. What you see up there are my three children. <laughs> not the middle one of them, right? The middle one was running around somewhere. He's uh, three years old. I was born and raised in uh, India. As I was growing up, I used to watch a lot of Hollywood movies. And the only perception I had of America and Americans is that each single one of you, <laughs> each single one of you, you carry weapons, you go out with the weapons, and you shoot each other out. <laughs> I know that's not the case, right? But after I came here, when I socialized with my classmates, with the neighbors, with the fellow Americans, my fear of the unknown and the misconceptions I had, they dropped. So I hope and pray that when we came here together as brothers and sisters in humanity, inshallah, God willing, our fear of the unknown of each other is going to drop and we can uh, work uh, with each other for the betterment of America, inshallah, God willing. Amen. So with that being said, I want to thank all of you. First and foremost, as I walked in here, I saw our guest with flowers and handing those to our Muslims over here. And for that, I want to applaud all of you for doing that, for showing us the alliances for the Muslim community. Last night, I had a session with the youth, the Muslim youth. And I asked them a very, very important question that uh, how do you guys feel about uh, the elections? The very first person, he's an eight-year-old, he raised his hand and he said, I feel very bad. The second person, I asked him, he raised his hand and he said, he didn't say anything, but the initial thing that he said was, my life is done with. And I, I almost cried when I, you know, he's so young, he's like 10 years old. And these are our youth. And this is how they feel. They feel fearful. Initially, first and foremost, as Muslims, as minorities, with all the hate and fear mongering which is out there. So when we see the support, you know, this is overwhelming, by the way. This is overwhelming. When we see the support, Samma, where is Samma? Yes, you know, first and foremost, give him a big hand, by the way. He did such a good job. <laughs> Last week, he gave me a call. You know, Brother Sabir, we have 70 people who are SVP. I said, wonderful, that is very good. <laughs> Four days ago, he said, you know, Brother Sabir, that went to 100. I said, that's good. <laughs> Two days ago, he said 200. Yesterday, he said 300. And last night, he said maybe 400. Right? I said, we have, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> but then I said, you know, that's a good problem. I, I, I hope and pray that every mosque, every church, every synagogue has the same problem. Right? That restores, really. Because all day, all day long, wall-to-wall uh, -wall coverage, the fear mongering going on, we are all fearful. In fact, as I was driving here, we made a call to Norway. My in-laws are in Norway, by the way. I asked them the question, how do you feel in Norway, like far away from the US? How do you guys feel up there? And almost every single person they said, they're all fearful. They're all here, but not just the Muslims up there. They're all very much involved in the community and they said they're all fearful. But this is what we told them. God is always in control. Whatever happens, 
It is there's a long-term benefit or some benefit in whatever is going on here. So as long as the good-hearted, the good-minded people come together, work together, inshallah, God willing. No fear mongerer, no hater, no Islamophobe, no anti-Semite is going to break the alliance, the friendship, and the humanity that we have, inshallah. I'm being told that uh, in the back you cannot uh, hear me. Yes? No? You are able to. Okay. No? Okay. Can you hear me now? Right. Thank you. Okay, that being said, uh, did you all enjoy the food? sure that yes, somebody liked it there, right? wonderful. Now, it's my tradition that uh, before I start a presentation, but let, let me just also mention this very important, about the alliances, about working together. It reminded me in the 7th century, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was a youth, he was not yet appointed as a prophet. So during his time, there was one person whose rights were taken away by the Arabs. And this is before Islam came to Arabia. So what Muhammad, peace be upon him, what he did was, he called the people of the Quraysh, people of Mecca, people of different surrounding towns, and he made an alliance with them, saying that despite the differences that we have, despite different races and nationalities and tribes that we have, let's all work together to give the rights to the people whose rights have been taken away. Right? So that was the example of Prophet Muhammad that I could recall right away. The second important, I received a WhatsApp message by the way, saying that, you know what some people are saying, that they want to register the Muslim. Correct? So, some good-hearted people, they actually started a registry. And the name of the registry is, Register Us That Today. And so far in the last two days, 21,000 people registered for it. Yes. Right? Come on. Where is my friend Ken over here? Ken. Give him a big hand, by the way. Ken. Yes. What Ken has mentioned that really touched my heart is that Ken said, you know, Dr. Sabil, if they are going to start a registry for the Muslims, I would be the first one to register. Yes, good evening again. In case if they do start a registry for the Jewish people, I would be the first one. If they start this, if they start for the African American, I would be the first one. If they start for the women, I would be the first one. No? Come on, they have to. Let's throw them off, right? Let's throw them off. Now, with that being said, there would be a short presentation about Islam, the fundamentals, followed by the Q&A because sometimes I do feel, just like as I was growing up in India, I had fear of the unknown because I did not knew the wonderful American people. In the same way, some people may have the fear of the unknown due to Islam or because of Islam, lack of knowledge. And that's one of the reasons that people may have Islamophobia, fear of the unknown. So I'm going to provide a short quiz just to see where you stand in your knowledge of Islam. Are you ready for it? Yes? Your prize would be extra samosas. Yeah? Are you good for it? Alright. So here is the very first question to you. By the, by the raise of hand. By the raise of hand. Who do you think is the most mentioned prophet by name in the Quran. And you cannot look at your Google search, by the way. Okay, go for it. Raise your hands, please. 
man. E. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Is that your final answer? <laughs> yeah? Well, sorry, in the back. G, well, she said Jesus. Okay, fine. Jesus is mentioned 25 times. Yes, ma'am. Abraham. Abraham, peace be upon him. He's mentioned 69 times, second most number of times. Now we are down to four. <laughs> Moses, who said that? Give her, give her a big hand. She got it. All right. Moses is mentioned, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, 136 times. The most number of times in the Quran, followed by Abraham, and Jesus mentioned 25 times, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, he's mentioned only five times. By name in the Quran. So the point I'm trying to derive is that Muslims, I cannot be a Muslim if I do not believe in the prophets of the old. For me to be a Muslim, I have to believe in Jesus, peace be upon him, and Moses, and Abraham, and Noah, and David, and Ishmael, and Isaac, all the prophets. So that shows the commonality that we have. That, you know, I have studied the Bible, by the way. When I study the Bible, and the Quran, and I have studied the Vedas and different scriptures, I see close to 65 to 85 things in common. So usually I say to the youth, uh, all of you are youth, right? <laughs> I usually say this, that there are more things in common that should unite us than things of differences that sometimes we fight over the devices. So let's work on the commonalities that we have. Very important question here. Who is the only lady mentioned by name in the Quran? A raise of hand. Yes, sir. Mary, give her a big, give her a big hand. Yes, you got it. Oh, wonderful. In fact, those who may have read the Quran, the Quran has 114 sections, as we say, surahs or chapters. Chapter number 19 is known as the chapter of Mary. Yes, chapter, the whole chapter is dedicated by name to Mary. In fact, you'll be surprised to find out that uh, in chapter 3, verse number 49, God sent an angel to Mary, and the angel is saying that, Oh Mary, God has chosen you, God has purified you, and God has chosen you above all the women. That's the honor, the respect, and the love that Islam gives and all the Muslims give to Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon him. In fact, when you see the Muslim ladies wearing the hijab, they want to reflect the chastity, the, the, the modesty that Mary used to reflect. In fact, there is no chapter in the Quran known as the chapter of Amina. Amina was the mother of Muhammad, peace be upon him, by the way. Or the daughter or the wife of Muhammad, peace be upon him. But we have a chapter called the chapter of Mary that shows the love, the respect, the honor. Now this one is the easiest of all, by the way. Who do you think Muslims worship show of hand? Yes, ma'am. Give him a big hand! You got it! Oh, all right. Now, I asked the same question to a friend of mine in the hospital. You know, Joe, who do you think Muslims worship? And Joe, of all the answers, the one that he gave was number C, Buddha. I said, come on, man, Joe, you should know better. We don't worship a man or idol or creation. We only worship the creator, who in Arabic, we call his name as Allah. All right, this is the last one, by the way. This is a very important one. When do you think Muslims came to the U.S.? Raise your hand. This is, yes, ma'am, up there, yes. Yourself. Yes. Yeah, give her a big hand. In fact, in fact, you'll be surprised to find out that many of your ancestors, when they came from Europe and different places, Muslims were already here to greet your ancestors. <laughs> yeah? yeah, come on, that's true. In fact, Muslims were celebrating Ramadan and Muslim holidays way before the, our Christian friends were celebrating Christmas with the Christmas tree. Yes. I wish and hope that the, our friend Mr. Trump was here to hear that. <laughs> Now, when Muslims came over here, 
Initially, they were brought as slaves. Then a big wave came, businessmen, and then the white collar, the physicians, the IT professionals, all throughout the centuries. Right? Here are some of the faces of Muslims in the USA, as you could see there. There are people, the very first one up there, he was uh, one of the founders of YouTube. Then you have Malcolm X, right? The civil rights uh, leader. Muhammad Ali, who knows Muhammad Ali? Right? <laughs> right, the big boxer. Then you have uh, the rest of them, right? You have Keith Allison and Ingrid Madsen, Jonathan Brown, uh, Dave Chappelle. Yeah, Dave Chappelle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, what do you see up here? What is that building? That's the Lewis Tower, right? Sears Tower, Lewis Tower. Look, one of the main architects of the Lewis Tower was no other than a Muslim from Bangladesh whose name was Fazlur Rahman. As you go up there, and you, as you walk down the exit, you will see his uh, sculpture up there, right? Fazlur Rahman. The, the reason I have this uh, building up there is because I want to rub this in. <laughs> That Lewis Tower is taller than the Trump Tower. <laughs> All right, with that being said, let's get really quickly in the short few minutes, really basics of Islam. You may have heard the word Allah before. When we say the word Allah, we mean the same creator who created all of us just in Arabic language. The Arabic language, is word is Allah. Like in Hebrew language, it could be Jehovah, Elohim. In the language of Jesus, it is, uh, it is Allah or Ilah. In the language of Arabic, it is Allah. So Allah is not a tribal God, a God of the Muslims or an Arab God. The same creator in Arabic is known as Allah. Now these are some of the attributes of God. Let me say that He is eternal, He does not have any parents. We also say that He does not have any children. We don't believe in the sonship, in the daughtership, or the uncleship, or the grandparentship of God. We say His one is unique. We respect our Christians, our Jewish faith, but this is what uh, Muslims believe. We say He does not have any partners. For that reason, as you may have walked, when you walk in the mosque over here, you don't see any uh, statue of Muhammad, peace be upon him. You don't see any cross, you don't see any symbols. When we worship the Creator, we worship Him directly because we say that He's all knowing and He's all hearing. So that is very unique to uh, the concept of God in Islam. Two important attributes of God. One of the attributes is that He's an all loving Creator. You know the oxygen that you and me breathe? You have to go and purchase it from Walmart or Craigslist, right? You don't have to. We say that God, by His mercy, guiding, loving nature, He gave us the resources. He loves humanity. So, for the love of humanity, Islam said that God wants to guide humanity. And to guide humanity, Islam says that God did not come down and became a human. He remained God and He appointed prophets and messengers, as you can see on this slide over here. We say that the very first prophet, or the very first human, Adam was also the very first prophet of God. And God told to Adam and Eve, enjoy all the things in the garden, but do not, um, do not approach this one tree, this one fruit, and then we know what happened. Somebody deceived them, and then the very first sin occurred. But here is a slight difference between our Christian friends and the Jewish friend and our Muslim Islamic faith, what we believe. We believe it was not just the Eve who committed the first sin. We say that both Adam and Eve, they were equally responsible for committing the very first mistake. Number one. Number two, it says in the Quran, chapter 7, verse number 23, that as soon as they committed the mistake, they realized they did something wrong. So they both repented to God and it says in the Quran that God forgave them. God forgave them. That means we do respect our Christian friend but we say that sin is not passed from them to any one of us. That they asked for forgiveness and God forgave them. 
So every single child, according to Islam, is born with a pure faith, with a pure innate nature. Only after they reach the age of puberty, if they commit the right reward, if they choose the wrong choices, then there will be consequences. Right? So when Adam and Eve, Eve, when they were created, they were given this very important commandment that submit yourself to only one God. It says in the Quran, chapter 16, verse number 36, as humanity was increasing, then God gave the same commandment to other prophets and messengers, namely, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and the last one, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So let me ask you this quiz question. The absolute submission to one God in Arabic language is what? What is the Arabic name for the absolute submission to the one creator alone? It's in there, by the way. You're looking at it. All right? Yes, ma'am. She got it. Give her a big hand. All right? Wonderful. Two for two. Yes. So we say that Islam is not a new faith. Islam, submission to one God is the same fundamental truth that God gave to all the prophets and the messengers. So for that reason we say that Islam is not a 7th century faith. Islam was not founded by Muhammad, peace be upon him. Islam was given to the very first human and all the prophets were given the same fundamental truth. Worship the creator and not the creation. Now, these are some of the passages from the Quran that signifies to that, by the way. In chapter 3, verse number 67, chapter 3, verse number 51, different places in the Quran, it mentions the same fundamental truth. Submission to the Creator and not the creation. What you see up there, are, these are some of the prophets which are mentioned in the Quran. And you'll be surprised to find out, those who are from the Christian background and the Jewish background, that all the prophets that you see up there, many of them, they are also mentioned in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, right? So that shows again the commonality that we have. Of the two sons who I have, one of them is named Abraham or Ibrahim. The second one is Yusuf, right? So we admire, love, and respect all the prophets to such a degree that we give the name to our children based upon the prophets and the messengers of God. So obviously the last one that we believe, according to the Quran, chapter 33, verse number 40, was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What do you think happened in the year 610, by the way, in the context of Islam? Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was born in the year 610. When he was, no, in 570, when he was 610, he was 40 years of age. That's when, that's when Angel Gabriel was sent by God and that's how the revelation of the Quran came to be revealed. Right? The passages of the Quran. So he was appointed as a prophet. But before he was a prophet, he was the most credible person in the society. That you know nowadays, whenever youth has to introduce some other youth to a person who is new to them, they may say that, you know, this is my friend, Joe, he's good in basketball, he's good in Minecraft, or Pokemon, right? They may introduce like that. But in the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, they used to introduce him saying that, this is our countryman, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he's the most honest, and he's the most truthful. That was the credibility that he had. So, when he was born, almost all of, all of Arabia and almost all the world, they were literally in the state of darkness. Women were subjugated. Jewish people, the rights were taken away. Wars used to be rampant. Racism used to be all over the place. But Muhammad, peace be upon him, by the guidance of God, he abolished racism. He brought unity to the people, let go of the wars, and very important, he gave the rights, the protection, and the safety with the Jewish cousins. And this is how we did. This is a very important point, by the way. The reason it's important because nowadays when we look at the Palestinian, the Israeli tension and the wars and all the chaos going on, it's important for us to know 
that we have a model in which how Muhammad peace be upon him, how we brought unity and safety and harmony and peace between different communities. In the Jewish Journal, there was a very important article that came in 2012, May 2012. In that article, the Jewish professor David Wallenstein, he said, the very first sentence he said was that, so what did the Muslims do for the Jews? The very first sentence, Islam saved the Jewry. This is a very unpopular, discomforting claim in the modern world, but it is a historical truth. Jewish professor saying that. And the reason he's saying that is that at the advent of Islam in Arabia in the 7th century, the Jewish people were preyed upon by the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire and other empires to the extent they were, they were on the state of extinction of our Jewish friends. At that time, Muhammad peace be upon him, when he moved from Mecca to Medina, the very first thing that he did, he wrote or he dictated the Medina Charter. In the Medina Charter, he said that the Jewish people and the Muslim people will be one people. The Islam is going to protect them. That they will have autonomy to practice their faith, freedom to practice their faith. You will have your own churches, your own your culture, your own synagogues. You have total autonomy. Within the Islamic land, you are free to practice your faith. No one can forcefully convert you. You are part of us. We are going to protect you. Yes. So that was the very first reason, according to the professor Wallenstein, that Islam protected the Jewish people. The second reason that he gave was Muslims and the Jewish people in Spain, you know, right after the Islamic, uh, the, the Spanish Inquisition, right? Some of you may remember. <laughs> well, you don't remember, but you read all the history, right? I don't think any one of you are that old. <laughs> Spanish Inquisition. That's when the Muslims and the Jewish people, they were literally forcefully converted, some of them. Some of them were kicked out. The witch hunt was taking place. It was literally chaos. At that point, the Muslims opened our land, our hearts, and provided safety to the Jewish people in North Africa, in the Ottoman Empire, and yes, in Palestine. In Palestine. Because of that, some Jewish scholar, according to the Jewish virtual library, they say that the golden age of Judaism was under the Muslim Spain. So a very important point, my dear Muslims and my dear guests from different backgrounds. When we work with each other, and that's a very good example. So an important point is that we as humans, we have to look out for those people who are meek, who are weak, and who are oppressed. Doesn't matter what faith they belong, our scriptures say that, our prophets say that, and humanity says that. So I hope and pray that we take that to heart, and we, 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 we work with each other to look out for the safety of each other, inshallah. All right, so with that being said, I was notified that we have a very important personality amongst us, and uh, someone is going to introduce that person, inshallah. Yeah, so really quickly, I had mentioned to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. I had mentioned to everyone that we have some really amazing people here, including yourselves. In specific, we have uh, the newest member elect of the U.S. House of Representatives from the Illinois Eighth District. This one, Raja Krishnamurthy here. And we are just excited to have him here. He's been a big supporter of us and I'd like you to come up to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and and, and I, I, I want to observe the three rules of public speaking. Be short, be sweet, and be gone. <laughs> That's okay with you. So I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to Aluna, 
for opening up this beautiful mosque for all of us to participate in celebration of their religion, but all, all of our religions. Can you give them a big round of applause? This is amazing. This is amazing. I've never seen anything like this. I, I, I've um, stood outside those double doors shaking many hands on, on days of Friday prayer um, as someone who is campaigning for office, uh, but as also someone selfishly who is seeking blessings from every single religion under the sun. <laughs> and so I thank you again for opening up your doors. Uh, second point, I want to say thank you to all of you for coming here today. Because you are showing an open hand, an open heart, and love and respect for your fellow man, which we need more than ever in this country. Do you agree with me? Third and final point. Third and final point. You've heard of evangelical Christians, and I love and admire them. I'm an evangelical American. I preach the values of freedom, liberty, equality, hard work, and prosperity. And if you believe in those values, you are an American. It does. Yes, you can clap. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter whom you love or how you pray or how you dress. And yes, it doesn't matter how many letters there are in your name. <laughs> All that matters is this. All that matters at the end of the day is this. Do you want to live a life of character? Do you raise your children right? Do you do everything in your power to try to give back to your community and make America and your community just a little better off than the way you found it. And if you believe in that, you are an American. Because at the end of the day, many of us came in many different ships to this country. But we are all in the same boat together now. And that matters, that means that we're going to row it together in the same direction. We're going to treat each other with love and dignity and respect. And we're, we're going to make sure, make sure that we go, uh, go forth and collectively deal with our collective challenges together. Do you agree with me? So I close with my favorite saying, which is that yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, but today's a gift. That's why we call it the present. And so I am just blessed to be here in the present, to celebrate the future of Al Huda, to celebrate the future of our entire community, and how together we're going to make America a better place. So thank you so much, and God bless you, God bless Al Huda, and God, God bless the United States of America. Thank you so much. Oh, wonderful. That now motivates us even more, right? Yeah. All right, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. So I will just speak for 10 minutes, then we'll have Q&A, but before that we have a very special way, right? Inshallah, God willing, we are going to call that special guest. Now, one of the fundamental principles of Islam is to make sure that we provide justice to all the people, right? So there is a very important passage in the Quran. I'm just going to paraphrase it. It says in chapter number 4, verse number 135, and God is speaking initially to the Muslims, and God is saying that all you, be, all you who believe stand up for justice. No matter if the justice is against you, or against your parents, or against your loved ones, or the rich or the poor, stand up for justice. So a very important uh, narration that happened, a very important story that happened about 1400 years ago. In the true Islamic state, I have to say the word true, okay? In the true Islamic state, when the fourth caliph was ruling, his name was Ali. He was the head of the state. So he, one morning, he went to the market. And in the market, as he was shopping around, he saw 
a Jewish person selling a sword. As soon as Ali saw that he's selling a sword, he realized that, you know, that sword belongs to me. How come he's selling my sword? He approached the Jewish, just remember, he's the head of the state and he's having a quarrel with a Jewish person who was a minority. And he said to the Jewish person, that's my sword. And the Jewish person said, no, that's my sword. Who's going to decide? I mean, he had the authority to bring the soldiers and to snatch the sword away. But that's not Islamic justice. So both of them, the head of the state and this Jewish person, they both went to the Supreme Court. And the Chief Justice was a Muslim. And the Muslim said, the Justice, both of you sit down on equal level. Ali, you cannot sit down on a you know, big chair just because you're head of the state. No, in front of me, you're all equal, both. And then he said to Ali, the Justice, present your case. And Ali said, let me bring my family. But the Justice said, you cannot bring your family, they cannot be your witnesses. That's not allowed in Islam. And because of lack of evidence, the Chief Justice, he said, I'm going to give that soul to the Jewish person. And the Jewish person, he stood up, he was crying, and he said, you know, in fact, I found that soul last night in the darkness, and I found it, and I'm selling it. But then he said, crying, he said, in fact, the soul belongs to you, but I'm really amazed at the, at the Islamic justice. My, my judgment was in my favor, the judgment is my favor. The head of the state, the justice was a Muslim in a true Islamic state, and then they gave me the soul, the judgment. So that shows that yes, in Islamic justice, we are supposed to be so careful, doesn't matter if it goes against us or against our loved ones. Here are some of the that Islam has provided under the Islamic rule to the Jewish, the Christian and other minorities. This is a letter that was written by the second caliph, Umar. He wrote a letter to the Christian church and the letter says that this is the security given to Umar by Umar to the people of Jerusalem. They are guaranteed the security of their persons, their possessions, their churches, their crucifixes and everything within. The churches will not be occupied, demolished, they will not be forced away from their religion or harmed because of it. I have to emphasize on this letter and also on the wonderful way that Muhammad peace be upon him. He gave justice and safety to the Jewish people is because just in case if you see some misguided Muslim going against the true principles, the teachings, the justice and the peace of Islam, they are not the spokespeople for Islam. What speaks for Islam are the Quran which is the word of God, the guidance and the noble example of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Very very important. Let, let, us, not, let us not have the media become the spokespeople for any one of us. We should stand for justice and our scriptures are the source and definitely when it comes to Islam, it is the Quran and the example of Muhammad peace be upon him. You know, unfortunately, racism is rampant around the world. And I would say that, you know, despite all the wonderful things in this country, this is still the situation in this country. When they took the data from our African-American brothers and sisters, only 8% they said that our country has the, had made the changes needed to give blacks equal rights with the whites. Only 8% believed that. In the time of Muhammad, peace be upon his situation, people used to boast that I'm white, I'm black, I'm Arab, I'm this tribe. But then Muhammad, peace be upon him, he mentioned to them, is no superior to a non-Arab. A non-Arab is no superior to an Arab. A white person is no superior to a black person. A black person is no superior to a white person. And the best amongst you is manners, who is bias. So by his teachings and by his implementation of this, 
we found out that racism, anti-Semitism, or any Muhammad peace be upon him by the guidance of God, he abolished it to such an extent that people used to come to the come together in the Prophet's mosque. The blacks, the whites, the Arabs, the non-Arabs, they used to stand shoulder to shoulder and they used to pray next to each other. So that's also one of the fundamental beliefs of Islam. In the neighbors, Muhammad peace be upon him, he said that you are not a believer if you eat your full and if your neighbors are hungry. And Muhammad peace be upon him, he said that Say something good, remain silent. And I say to this to all, the whole world by the way, that how many marriages could be saved? Right? Come on. Somebody's happy. There you go. How many friendships could be saved? How many wars could be prevented? Say something good or remain silent. Such a fundamental truth. But peace be upon him. By the guidance of God, he mentioned that one of the assignments for a Muslim is not just to come and pray five times a day or fast in the month of Ramadan or give the charity. It is important that as Muslims, my assignment is to make sure that I become a peaceful and proactive force in the society. That means if I see some people who rights are taken away, if I see terrorism or poverty or racism, I should be and the Muslims should be in the forefront of working with the good-hearted people and good-minded people to eradicate the evils and to enjoy good. And that is what Islam teaches us. And those are some of the passages that you see up there. So when Hurricane Matthew occurred, Muslim volunteers, but literally tens and thousands of them, from many mosques and many relief organizations, we were there, knocking at the doors of the people, if you need help, what can we give it to you? So Muslims were there in the forefront. When the, when the Haiti earthquake happened in 2011, around that time, no less than 10,000 patients were treated by the Muslim physicians who went to Haiti. In the first three months, 10,000 patients were treated. There are no less than 100 free clinics in the USA run by the Muslims to cater to the uninsured, to the underinsured, to the people who are seeking for help. So in different ways, Alhamdulillah, God willing, that people are helping humanity. When it comes to, uh, why do I have chemistry and pharmacology there, right? <laughs> <laughs> chemistry, is this a chemistry 101? Yeah, Sister Candice, ready for it? Yes. Yes, all right. <laughs> now, I mean, you'll be amazed to find out that in the Quran, there are no less than 750 times God is instructing humanity. Think and ponder, use your brain. Do not blindly follow. Experiment and research. That's how you will find the truth. So taking that to heart, the Muslim scholars of the past, they were the movers and the shakers of the society, not just in, not just in the theological aspect, but in the secular world. In fact, the father of chemistry was Ibn Hayyan thousand years ago, you know, many of the youth, or when we were youth, when we went to the chemistry lab, the flask, the test tubes, and different acids and elements, he was the one who had discovered them and invented many of the flasks and many of the test tubes. When it comes to medical sciences, even seen, all right, he's called as the father of medicine. His book, the canon of medicine was the classical book all over Europe for four centuries. Whose favorite topic is algebra, by the way, right? <laughs> algebra and algorithms. al khawarizmi was the mathematician Muslim who invented those fields. And according to, according to Khali Fayorina, when she was an HP, CEO of HP, she said, she said that the, mathematic, the Muslim mathematicians created the algebra and the algorithms that would enable the building of computers and the creation of encryption. So next time, when you use your smartphone or use the texting or calling, it's important for you that this would not be there if Muslims were not in the picture. Yes. 
Right? That's one of the important foundations, algebra and algorithms. So in wrapping up, my dear Muslims, my dear guests, my dear fellow Americans and fellow humans, there are challenges in the world. There is a lot of bigotry and fear mongering and hatred and racism and terrorism out there in the world. But there are more people who are good hearted and good minded. They are. They are. When we work together, the way that the Quran says, as our esteemed scholar has uh, opened with the wonderful recitation, I will just give the translation. The Quran says in chapter 49, verse number 13, that O mankind, means God is saying that O humanity, O mankind, I have created you from one single male and one single female and made you into peoples and tribes that you get to know each other. That you get to know each other. Not that you may despise each other, but you get to know each other. And then God says that the best amongst you is the one who is the most well-mannered person. So I hope and pray that all of us working together, we can defeat fear and fear-mongering and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And inshallah, God willing, we can establish societies which are based upon morality, which are based upon equality, which are based upon unity, justice, and peace for all. And when we do that, inshallah, God willing, not only we can make America great again, we can make, inshallah, the whole world great again. Thank you very much. presentation and I hope that brought a, a good amount of clarity uh, to you on some of our beliefs and, and our culture. Uh, at this point I'd like to ask Karim Irfan to come up to say a few words. Brother Karim is the past president of the Council of Religious Leaders of Metro Chicago. He is also the past chairman of the CIOGC, the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago, uh, which is an umbrella organization of about a hundred plus mosques and institutions. So Brother Karim, thank you. Greetings of peace, my dear friends, brothers and sisters in faith and humanity, and fellow Americans. It is an absolute honor and delight to be here amongst you. I was participating in a leadership meeting just a few minutes ago of the Council of Islamic Organizations. And there were some important proceedings there, and they were a bit surprised that I had to take a break and get out of there. But let me assure you, at this moment, there is no other place in the world I would rather be than amidst you. And I say that because this, I don't know if you've had a chance, when I stand at this vantage point and look out at this gathering, I suggest before you leave, make sure you come out here and take a look at them. This is a heartening sight, my dear friends. This is quintessential America. The America of our founding fathers. The understanding that everyone is created equal and everyone shall be treated equal under the law and under the principles of this great country of ours. You, my friends, you are the reason the rest of this planet the rest of humanity looks out to us, this country, as a beacon of hope, as a beacon of exalted principles, as a beacon of what is good and what should be good. So do not feel that you are in a minority because you are what this country stands for. Let's give ourselves a round of deep-seated, heartfelt applause for what we are accomplishing today.
This gathering is a part of a series of open mosque days that have been conducted across the country over the last several months. In the Chicago area, I've had the privilege of participating in many of these. And the purpose here is to invite you all into our sanctuaries of worship. There are so many questions out there about what happens in the mosque that there are nests of radicalism, that people are being radicalized out here in the mosque. And we wanted to be sure you appreciate that those doors, like the doors of any mosque anywhere in the world, remain open for any human being to enter and benefit from the divine illumination and guidance that resides in the sanctuary, just as it does in your own places of worship. So we are here to remind ourselves of the shared values that we all have. The focus on family bonds, social justice, educational excellence, professional advancement, service for the common good, social betterment, ethical leadership, safety and security, the pluralism of faiths and ethnicities and cultures. That is what binds us all together and that is the reason for us to be, in, uh, to be heartened that despite what seems to be going on around the country, that we have reason to join hands together. And of course there are concerns. There are concerns about demagoguery, about faiths and minorities and immigrants about Islamophobia, about xenophobia, the focus on the other as something to be feared. And in that regard, uh, you, I'm sure you all are aware of what happened at the hip-hop musical Hamilton last night. Now, I'm not here espousing the booing of public, uh, the elected officials, but the message is very important. When the cast member who represented the vice president in that role stood up and said, Mr. Mike Pence, we welcome you here, he said. And this is the important message. He said, we are the diverse Americans who are alarmed and anxious that your new administration will not protect us, our planet, our children, our parents or that you will defend us and uphold our inalienable rights. We hope that this show has inspired you to uphold our American values and to work on behalf of all of us. We thank you, he ended, by saying we thank you for sharing this American wonderful story told by a diverse group of men and women of different colors, creeds, and orientations. That is what this gathering is about, my dear friends. What you have done here today is you have honored us. And I say that from the bottom of my heart. You are our guests and of course we appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to come here. But let me tell you that from an Islamic perspective and speaking on behalf of this wonderful mosque, the Masjid al Buddha, it stands for the guided institution. And I've been giving, to have the privilege of giving sermons here on Friday going back two decades or more. And I know that this institution is tremendously open, tremendously active in the betterment of society around us. So I give them strong thanks for allowing us to gather here. But despite all that, let me tell you that you, each one of you, my dear friends, you are doing me, each one of us, a favor. And let me tell you why. The verse that Mr. Sabil recited and emphasized it defines for Muslims the core objective of reaching out to others. It is called the verse of knowing, the verse of ta'aruf. In the language, I'm sure you've heard the much melodious recitation from our Imam, but for purposes of emphasizing this, let me state that again. The Lord says, Ya ayyuhannas, O mankind, we have created you from a single male and a female. This is the Lord, the divine, addressing each one of us. And particularly, I take this directly as an address to me from my Lord. 
And he and he's saying, وَجَعَلْنَكُمْ شُعُوبٌ وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُ And we made you into races and tribes so that you may know each other. And that word know is emphasized in the most comprehensive of contexts. I do not know you by just looking at you and saying, oh, this lady is charming, she's got her leather jacket on. That's not the purpose. I need to be looking deeper into and understanding what are these ladies doing. When I see this lady that clearly of Asian origin, I need to look at you and try to understand what is going on in your family. Is there something that I can connect with and share your concerns? When you see me, look at me looking different. A person with a beard and who clearly looks like one of these Islamic people. You need to be knowing me a little better and saying, what drives this person? Is there goodness in his heart that I cannot immediately fathom? That is what knowing is expected to be about. And importantly, the Lord then says, defines what is proximity to him. He says, the noblest on you in God's sight. The noblest of you, the Lord is saying, in my sight, are those who are most exalted before me and with each other. And then finally, lest I start getting into the sense of complacency that, oh, I'm in the mosque, I'm a Muslim, I am somehow among the chosen people, I will not be accountable on the Day of Judgment, the Lord then makes it clear that, Inna Allah alimun khabir. He says, verily, God is the one who is omniscient and fully aware. That's a warning to me. Don't assume that just because you are out there giving a Friday sermon or, or leading some prayers, you are saved. He says, I truly know who is the best and be careful and warning. So ladies and gentlemen, your presence here as people of different faith, Christians, Jews, people of no faith if there are some, Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs, People of all those faiths, your presence allows us to connect as fellow humans, as fellow Americans. And that is the bond that we all need to be focusing on and sharing. And the Quran repeatedly stresses some concepts that I need to be keeping in mind in my dealings with my community members and with each one of you. And that is the concept of Ihsan, of excellence in all that I do. In my looking at you, perhaps giving a smile to this charming lady, saying, hey, this is something that I'm expected to do as a believer in the faith that the Lord has blessed me with. And then the concept of other, of justice, doing justice in all forms and under all circumstances. And then finally, focusing on the goodness of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord. As I was just driving out here, I noticed in uh, the a Lutheran church that I that I crossed the sign out there that said that said, "Turn to the Lord, for He is good." We all appreciate that the exalted form of goodness that we are assigned to the divine. We are expected to have a bit of that in my beliefs and in my actions. So today, my friends. Your presence allows me and allows my fellow Muslims to practice our obligation to be hospitable and to be tolerant and accepting of others. And this is particularly at a time when we see perhaps a little bit of shortage of tolerance, of concern for the oppressed, of those who have been displaced from their homes. Focus on the migrants as being negative somehow. Finally, I just want to remind myself, just today, our, are there, I'm pretty sure there are a bunch of uh, our Catholic friends here. People with, from the Catholic background, can you put up your hand? Ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you, uh, I, I, over the last three decades of the privilege that I've had to work in the interfaith area, I always bring out this point. I'll, I owe so much of my upbringing to the Jesuit tradition, to the wonderful the Catholic nuns who wrapped some sense into my knuckles with their rules. <laughs> so when I stand here proud as an American, as a lawyer, as a businessman, and as a leader in the community, I am proud to say that I owe that to that tradition. And in that regard, the, the comments that were made today by Pope Francis so heartening. Our own Archbishop uh, Silvich, He's, he was being uh, 
elevated to the level of cardinal just a few years, a few hours ago. Uh, I was privileged, I was asked by Mayor Emanuel to be with them at the consistory, and I would have loved to have done that. Unfortunately, there were too many conflicts, but I, I couldn't go. But just a few hours ago, I got this message from there saying, Kareem, look out for the message of the Pope on immigrants. And my dear friends, that is what our faith stands for. When the Pope, his uh, eminence, stands up and says that this world cannot turn its eyes away from the concerns of the displaced and the immigrants, that they are taking a stance against what happened, for instance, with Governor Pence in Indiana, when uh, Cardinal, when the Archbishop Tobin there took a stand and said, regardless of what the government says, we will open up our sanctuaries and our homes to the oppressed and to the migrants. So I end brothers and sisters in faith and my dear brothers and sisters uh, as um, fellow Americans. These are difficult times for us. There are trying times and we all have to make sure we turn back to what made this country truly the great country that it is. The core values of equality under the law, of justice, of concern, of compassion, of tolerance for everybody and going beyond tolerance to acceptance. So today, let us mark a new beginning here. And I want to appeal to each one of you. I do this at many of my gatherings. Each one of you is going to be, by the will of the Lord, an ambassador of peace and goodwill. May I have that commitment from you that the next time you hear something on television that says that people of some faith, whether it is Islam or Judaism, that they are somehow radicalized or hurting our country, that you will feel that twinge in your heart that no, I just heard from a bunch of my Muslim uh, Americans that their religion stands for peace and that I will give them that benefit. The next time you hear a divisive, the rhetoric, the rhetorical statement that comes out and says that, that American society is fractured, you will stand up and say, no, that is not what this country stands for, and that is not what I as an American stands for. So ladies and gentlemen, absolute delight and an honor to be here. You should be patting yourself on the back when you go back, talk to your friends and your relatives and say, my goodness, what an uplifting event we were privileged to be a part of. And the next time you get an opportunity, come show up with your friends and your relatives and your network and invite us into your sanctuaries, into your homes. And we would love to make sure that we connect as fellow beings, we connect as fellow Americans. Let us go back and recognize that this country does not need to be made great again. This is, remains, one of the greatest countries in the world and it's because of the great people like you. Let's regain that greatness. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, once again for honoring us. Thank you so much. And may the Lord be gone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Honestly, this is historic, and I, I appreciate all of you being here. I honestly do. Um, so I, we have a couple of options. Before, before I get into those options, I can see in the back there's standing room only. I want to mention a couple points. So it's 12.41. I'd like to have Q&A. We're a little bit behind schedule, but I'd like to have Q&A wrapped up by 1.15. At 1.15, we're going to have our communal call to prayer for our second prayer of the day. As you all know, as Muslims, we pray five times a day. So at 1.15, we will have our call to prayer by our Imam. It's beautiful. This is something that happens at every single mosque in this nation, in this, in, in, in this world. So it's something I really want you guys to experience. Beautiful. And then at 1.30, because of the, 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 the crowd, we're going to have only two rows here for the Muslims who will be praying. And downstairs, I'd like to advise all of our congregants to go downstairs to join, to join the Jama'at, the congregation prayer from there, as the, the, the voice will resonate down there. So please keep that in mind for our community members. So at this point, like I said, I'd like to start a Q&A and you know, one quick statement. The ball's on your court right now. Um, it's always been, but here is a chance to bring forth any questions you would like that's related to our faith, and I hope, I really do hope we have more of these opportunities 
Uh, but again, I can't really tell the future. Um, so again, take advantage of this moment. Right now we have a couple people passing out index cards. I'd like you guys to raise your hand. They have pens as well. At the same time, I will be walking around with a mic. Uh, and we'll have another brother who will be walking around with a mic as well. Again, if you guys have any questions or thoughts that you'd like to share, please do. Um, and again, if it's a deep question, I would highly advise you to maybe wait afterwards because I know we will have Brother Kareem and Brother Sabil uh, who will be here uh, with a couple other folks who can address your questions. But again, definitely ask questions um, and let's, uh, let's, let's begin. And again, our, our QA panel, I'd like everyone, whoever has an index card or gets an index card, give it to me and I'll filter it to Brother Kareem. Or Brother Kareem, you're staying? Good. So we're going to have Brother Kareem and, 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 and Dr. Sabil. All right. Yes. You're close. You are calling us to know you, to know our Muslim neighbors. What do you suggest that we can do going forward? What is our call to action in a practical way? Thank you so much. So the question is, uh, what is the call for action going moving forward? <coughs> I will provide maybe three call of actions, then our scholar is going to also provide some, okay? Number one is very important. All of you came over here. When you go back to your families, to your neighborhoods, to your friends, at least I hope and pray that you could say that we met the Muslims and Muslims are good people. <coughs> right? I hope you could say that. Number two, many of you, you may have uh, Facebooks, social media, Twitter. Post the photos up there, of the event up here, the wonderful gathering that we have up there, positive comments, number two. Number three, there are so many alliances that we are forming with the Hispanic community, uh, with African American community, and different such communities and causes. So nationally and locally, we have those. We can give you the details. So be part of those causes. And last but not the least, comes 21st of January, in case if I see or you see that any one of our brothers and sisters in humanity whose rights are taken away, that the Constitution provides, all of us should speak as one voice and help and stand with each other. That's the one and most important thing that all of us can do. Okay. We have quite a few questions, so let's let's keep uh, alternating. We'll go with the card, uh, Brother Green. Well, there are a couple of questions that can be very uh, quickly addressed. There's one which says, whenever you mention Muhammad, you say peace be upon him. Is that out of respect and spoken only by followers of Islam? That is a very per perceptive of you to have picked up on that sensitivity. Uh, you will notice, uh, well, you may, you may not have gotten a chance in today's discourse, but indeed, we do so out of extreme respect for the Prophet Muhammad and for all prophets. There's never a time a Muslim, I know I, uh, when I refer to the Prophet Jesus, I would at the least say that quietly to myself if I not put do not do that audibly, that we refer to the Prophet Jesus as we say, peace be upon him. The Prophet Moses, we say, peace be upon him. Abraham, peace be upon him or upon them all. This is a requirement for a Muslim that out of reverence, out of respect, that when we refer to the messengers of the Lord, because there is this connection to the divine, that we always attribute the peace and blessings of the Lord upon these messengers. So that's one thing. I will try to address uh, a, a, a question. You want to add up to that? There's something, no. There's something to this wonderful comment. Uh, so why do we say peace be upon him, right? As uh, the fun Karime says, out of respect. You know, just for example, Oh boy. Let's keep going. 
So just an analogy, right? Suppose uh, if President Obama walks in the room, right? We are not going to say, you know, hey, Obama, dude, when are you doing, right? We'll say, President Obama, it's an honor for us that you are here with us. So it's a form of respect and honor. We use the title for President Obama and we use peace be upon him. When we say Prophet Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon all of them. Um, there is a question about uh, Sunni and Shia. Can I quickly address this? Inshallah, right now. So this question is about Sunni, Shia, the different denominations. It's important for us to know that when Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was alive, he was the head of the state and he was also a prophet. After he passed away in the year 632 CE, Muslims have to appoint a new head of the state, not a new prophet, by the way. Because the Quran says in chapter 33, verse number 40, that he was the last prophet. So the majority of the Muslims at that time, they want to appoint someone who was eligible, who was the closest to the Muslims or to the Prophet, his name was Abu Bakr. Some minority of the Muslims, they would like to appoint someone who was also quite eligible, whose name was Ali. And he was the son-in-law and the cousin of Muhammad, peace be upon him. So it so happened that good old democracy, the, the bigger group went out, right? Abu Bakr. He was appointed as the first caliph. So, the division between the Sunnis, the Shia, is not about theology, it started with politics. Number one. Number two, when it comes to the label Sunni and Shia, that's not the label God has given to the follower of Islam. The follower of Islam, in the Quran, in chapter number 22, verse number 78, is called as a Muslim. Not as a Sunni, not as a Shia, by the way. For example, if someone were to ask me that, you know, Sabir, who are you? Are you a Sunni or are you a Shia? And I'm going to say that I am a Muslim. Yes, very important. There is only one Islam, the one that was brought by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, guidance of God. Really quickly footnote. That Sunnis and the Shias, if I have to use that label, it, they, they're not analogous to the Catholics, the Protestants, or the Jehovah's Witnesses. This is the reason. All the Muslims around the world, we have one, only one concept of God. God is only one, he's the creator, he's not the creation. Number two, when it comes to the Quran, we have the same Quran all over the world in Arabic language. Only one version of the Quran. Number three, when we pray, we pray in the same direction, the direction of Mecca. Number four, when it comes to the concept of who is Muhammad, peace be upon him, all the Muslims are unanimous that Muhammad is a messenger, peace be upon him. He's not God, son of God, and we have the same concept of the fundamental beliefs in the hereafter. So when it comes to the fundamentals, all the Muslims are united, one Islam, and Sunni and Shia, I would not label it that way. And this mosque is not a Sunni mosque or a Shia mosque. It's the mosque for Muslims and it's a mosque where everyone else is also welcomed. Thank you so much. Uh, before I go to uh, Brother Kareem, no good event is void from a parking announcement. <laughs> There's a black Honda Pilot 2015 or 2016 that's on the left side. Whoever's car it is, please move it, or else we will tow it, or scratch it up, or break the windows, or whatever else. So, Brother Kareem, and also, just before I hand it over to him, there are so many folks that I wanted to recognize and thank. Michelle Mussman, thank you. Mayor Rodney Craig, thank you. You guys have been very supportive of our communities. A lot of other folks, I'm still, again, Chief Mano, I see you, man. I see you. Uh, the, 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 the head police chief. Of Hanover Park. We have the Street One Fire Chief here as well. You can raise your hand. I'm not sure where you are. But a lot of trustees. Can I have all the trustees, village managers of the various cities, educators, teachers, principals? Don't be shy. I know you guys are there. I know you guys. I, I, I responded. There's a lot. There's one right there. All right, great. We have quite a few. Look. 
Don't be shy. But here, we'll pass it on. Um, again, I'm looking at the time, and, and we'll, we'll walk around for one question. Uh, but I'll let Brother Craig. Well, I, I picked these two questions because they come often, and they, they are a source of much uh, confusion and ambiguity. Why are Christians being persecuted in the Middle East? Let me give you a direct answer. When the, if there is any direct persecutions of Christians in some of the countries there, and there is, it has nothing to do with Islam. Let's be very clear about that. In fact, there, uh, I'm part of several international teams that are working together on the rights of non-Muslim minorities in Muslim-majority countries. We are working on that. So there is some, uh, 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 some focus in particularly some areas of the Middle East, but that is attributable to the, the governments that are in place and the monarchies that are in place. So let us be very clear about that. This cannot ever, to any extent, be justified, yeah, and particularly under the tenets of Islam. Okay, so that's one thing. The other question, there is a good question about what do Muslims believe about the practice of homosexuality? A simple answer to that and then a clarification. Okay? Homosexuality, according to the divine guidance that has come down to Muslims and through the saints and the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, homosexuality is a sin. The important thing for us to remember is according to the Islamic tradition, one focuses on the sin and not the sinner. So if uh, the same thing that goes against homosexuality, Islam is very particular about adultery. It is the, about uh, intoxication about lying. All of those things are considered sins in Islam. But my, uh, my tradition dictates to me that I, f uh, I go against the sin and ask for forgiveness and compassion and support and caring for any sinner. That applies across the board as an important tradition. And it keeps me humble, I can say, in my uh, dealings because it tells me that there are sins that I have that I also need to be concerned about. But there is one very important tradition in Islam which says that every single son of Adam, that is all of humanity, is a sinner. That tells me right away that everyone transgresses to one degree or another and then we are told them the best of the sinners are those who turn to the Lord in repentance and penitence. So it tells me, I'm not here to make judgment on people personally, but I do recognize what is wrong as wrong, and then try to make sure that I connect with people on that basis. That's one thing, and I guess there, there are a couple of other questions, but... Right, I guess there are questions from the audience, and then this gentleman is going around with a... We'd love to hear your comments, uh, if you have. Please go ahead, right? Yeah. Uh, please stand up and identify yourself, please. Oh, yes, my name is Martin Baumgartner. Mm -hmm. oh. I'm uh, so pleased that the Daily Herald had the article about your wonderful Turn program off. today. Off. Keep it up. I'm, uh, me personally, I'm confused as to what Sharia law is, and I would appreciate a, perhaps a brief explanation. So the question is, uh, what is the Sharia law? Now it's getting hard now. <laughs> peacefully with God and peacefully with humanity. Very simple. But sometimes when we look at the word Sharia law, uh, what is the very first thing that comes to your mind when you see or hear the word Sharia law? Theocracy or the punishment system, right? Cutting of hands, all of that, correct? Now it's very important, so let me, let me just give you this, this analogy. There, suppose if people from Mars, if they come down here, right? There is aliens. And if they ask me the question, okay, Sabir, what is the U.S. Constitution all about? And if I tell them that the U.S. Constitution, it kills people by electrocution, lethal injection, right? The punishment system. That's all I tell them and then they leave. Am I doing justice to the U.S. Constitution? I'm not because I left out the breadth and the beauty of the Constitution.
condition, I only emphasize on the punishment system. In the same way, within the breadth and the beauty of the Sharia law, less than 0.5% deals with the punishment system. The checks and balances that the government has to do with the rest of the citizens. Right? I mean, every citizen or every country has law enforcement. They have the police force, they have uh, the military, law enforcement, right? Checks and balances. In the same way, when you look at the Quran, it has 6,000 plus passages in there. Less than 10 of them deals with the punishment system. The rest of them deals with the wonderful guidance that God has provided to us. For example, when Islam says that there should not be any racism, all of humanity are equal, we should not judge each other by the, by the color of their skin, right? Like Martin Luther mentioned, or Muhammad peace be upon him, that all of us are children of Adam. We are not superior or inferior to each other. That's part of the Sharia law. Me taking care of my parents or my neighbors, that is part of the Sharia law. My becoming, me becoming an active force in the society is part of the Sharia law. Us Muslims inviting you here and feeding you the samosas, maybe it's part of the Sharia law. All right? When you see us pray the second prayer of the day, we are actually implementing the Sharia law. So Sharia law is not what we see on the TV, that people are committing atrocities, taking the rights of the minorities, or forcefully converting the people. If they are doing that, they are going against what Sharia law came for. Sharia law is a peaceful guidance that God has given to humanity, so we could connect peacefully with God, and we could connect peacefully with humanity. But Sharia law given to Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not the only guidance that God gave to humanity. When we look at the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, which are in Exodus chapter 20, verse number 3, that says that worship only one God, do not make any images of God, be good to your neighbors, do not lie, do not cheat. We say that that was part of the Sharia law guidance that God gave to humanity to Moses and his people. So it's very important, Sharia law is God's guidance, that it has a personal basis that we can implement anytime. When, we, when I fast, I am following the Sharia law. But Sharia law on a state basis, the economic system, political system, justice system, that is only to be implemented in a true Islamic state the way Muhammad, peace be upon him, did. When he implemented, he abolished racism intoxicants, gambling, he abolished racism, right? And all the things that are there that we are going over the problems, he abolished those problems because of the Sharia law, right? And nobody can force Sharia law on other people, by the way. So Muslims are not here to uh, dismantle the constitution and have the Sharia law. We are here peacefully as Americans, following the constitution. So the second part of the question was, what is the similarity between the Constitution and the Sharia law, right? If the Constitution says, democracy says equality of all the races, that's what the Sharia law says. If our rules and regulations, morality says, be good to your neighbors, that's what Sharia law preaches. So at the end of the day, Sharia law is God's guidance. Anyone can abuse any concept. May that be the crusaders who abuse Christianity. May there be some Jewish people who abuse Judaism or the Hindus who abuse their concept of theology. And some Muslims, they abuse the noble concept of Sharia law or Jihad or other Arabic terminologies. If they are doing that, they are going against what Sharia law came and what God's guidance came for. Right? So that's what Sharia law is. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. one quick point again, it's 1 o'clock at 1.15, I'm going to ask our Imam to call the prayer. Again, if I can have some volunteers say, setting up for the congregational prayers downstairs, we will have maybe two rows here. So once that gets filled, I need everyone else of our congregants to go downstairs. I also quickly wanted to, before I give it to Brother Green, uh, recognize someone here that's very special. Father John Deerhammer, if you could come up for just a quick minute to say a few words. He's a uh, father of uh, the Church of the Holy Spirit, and he came here with his mom. It was awesome. Okay. It was awesome.
amazed at the number of Catholic hands that went up. And I was amazed that they were so close to the front. Usually they're in the back. So I thought uh, over the last few days after the election about what we have on our money. Every single piece of our money has a short Latin phrase. What is it? A pluribus, pluribus unum, from the many one. So I think that's really our task as the days go ahead, from the many one, to live up to that, to work hard to make sure that uh, e pluribus unum becomes a part of what we do each and every day. And thank you very much to uh, Masjid al Buddha for having this day. And also we're very, very happy to have the mosque as part of the Schomburg Hoffman Estates Clergy Association. Uh, Dr. Khalid Sami works uh, so well with us, and uh, we really appreciate your cooperation and your help. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Dr. Khalid Sami. Any questions? Please stand up. We can also interface and outreach. A lot of you guys go in. He's done amazing work for our community, and please recognize him. Thank you. Also, one quick thing. Uh, Ali Padre, can you raise your hand? Ali. Ali is back there and he's, he's doing Islamic calligraphy in Arabic. So before you all leave, please stop by. He'll write your name in Arabic. And it's great because you can go home, you can put it, you can hang it up on your wall, and then when your mom or your family comes over, they're like, oh my god, what is that? <laughs> okay, I know you have falafels in the fridge, but this is too much, man. Calm down. So again, make sure you stop by Ali Padri to get your name written in Islamic here calligraphy. Next question. Uh, said, you make a wonderful gesture. You, sir, you make a wonderful gesture. <laughs> this one. from St. James. Uh, you are people here. Can you hear me? Is this coming across okay? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You are people of good... Uh, was mentioned. Uh, I'm the sort of guy who picks a little bit at words, and I'm just sort of befuddled by what I see as a non sequitur and the logic of uh, Muslims loving everybody of all faiths. And I'm quoting now from the Quran. Uh, 1A Aggression in Jihad, Surah uh, 66-9 and 929A. 66-9 says, O Prophet, strive against the disbelievers and hypocrites and be stern with them. Hell will be their home, a happily, hapless journey's end. And then from 929A, fight against such of those who have been given the scripture as believe not in Allah, nor the last day. And I think, according to what I read, I've done a little traveling, that part of the demonic motivation of the ISIS people is the motivation that comes from a sort of an ignorant acceptance of these sort of surahs here. Can you come on that, please? Well, wait, this works. <laughs> One of these will get the message across. <laughs> That's fine. This is working. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, if I understand your, your concern correctly, there is uh, a a shared concern about how the principles of Islam are being distorted by uh, these folks from whether it was previously Al-Qaeda and then ISIS. And uh, there's much to be talked about there, uh, but let us understand very clearly that you always have within all faiths a segment of people who tend to uh, manipulate, distort uh, the literal uh, interpret and uh, me meanings of what is being revealed and then interpret it according to their own uh, uh, distorted perspectives. So we have that serious concern and we constantly throughout the leadership and the mosque try to be aware of that so that our youngsters are constantly exposed to what, what they need to be looking out for, what sources or the information they get uh, that uh, they're uh, uh, 
understanding from. But there's a, a deep discussion that we can have, and I'd love to have some uh, off, uh, offline discussions with you, sir. There was a very important question that is practical, and I thought I'd address that. Uh, some, uh, I'm sure it was a young a lady in the audience, but perhaps I could be wrong, who said, what can we do to be helpful to Muslim women? I don't want to take that on, because that is a topic that hits home to so many of us. We all have our wives and our daughters. Uh, my wife has wears her hijab, covers her hair. Our daughter does that from business, but she still has her uh, hair covered. And what I can assure you, and perhaps this is the, you, you need to hear that more from uh, our women than you do from me, but let me assure you that the last thing that Islam does or teaches me is to oppress our women. It's in fact one of the things that I'm constantly accused of in my dealings at home and in my interfaith work is when you, you just put women up on too high a pedestal is what they always tell me because that's how we have been brought up that women are to be respected and cared for and loved and, uh, and do everything possible to make life easy for them. Anyway, so what there, uh, there are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind. These days, it is getting rougher out there for Muslim women in their scarves and hijab to be out there on their own. My wife has faced uh, comments and, and, and you heard about reports where uh, most uh, uh, distressingly there was this man in the south who approached a woman wearing a hijab with a lighter and said, you yank it off right now or I'm setting you on fire. And she made the right choice and she, she, she just didn't go ahead and have a fight with him. So we have those concerns. So what can you do, my dear friends, out of your concern that you have expressed sincerely? Uh, know that there is that tension that our women, your sisters in American life are facing. What can you do? The next time you see somebody who looks like a Muslim, somebody who's covering her hair, give her a smile. Give her a smile of acceptance. And if you can approach, and, and I say that with emotion, because uh, just a couple of days ago, my daughter came up to me, and she was in tears uh, because somebody had approached and done just that to her. That little gesture that comes up. Uh, when people say, hey, we are not all bigots. We are not all racist. We don't think you are uh, out there to kill us. Just that little gesture of a smile. And if you can approach and give, have a talk and say we are in this together. And now you will notice that there is so much misunderstanding as they have made the announcement for the prayer. You, there is a question that is often asked, why are women separated in the mosque? When you stand back and watch how we pray, a lot of it will get answered by itself. Look, we are expected, one of the biggest obligations when we are praying is to achieve proximity to the Lord. And we are told that a, a human being is closest to his or her Lord when he or she is bowed down on the ground in penitence and in humility before the majesty of the Lord. So you will notice that as part of our rituals, we both go down on our knees, we put our forehead on the ground and pray. Now, in that position, ladies will understand, but the young ladies, be, uh, be, you have concern about what can be visible, right? When you're down there, going down, you're bound down on your knees, and, you, and your sh shirt goes up, or your skirt gets misplaced. There are all those practical considerations. So, you will notice that we respect our women, they have a place up there, and they are welcome to come down here, but as part of the prayers, they are in a sense of modesty praying by themselves. So, that is one of the explanations you need to keep in mind, where there is no denigration of women. So, I end with that, and I know we are running out of time, but ladies, I'd be remiss if I did not remind you of this obligation. As you leave here, this was not just a, a, a meet and greet and go back and forget obligation, right? Yep. So, please take this on as a serious uh, commitment that you have made to us as fellow Americans that we will go out with the understanding that we are in this together, that we are people of different faiths, we are the strength of this country, and that we will hold hands and we'll stand up to the divisive forces that are out there and let them know we will not let this country be divided, we will stand together proud in keeping this country great. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you have a question about the separation? They have two flat screen TVs up there, man. Look at this. It's awesome. But anyways, we're going to end with one final question, and it's not the end. At 1.15, our Imam is going to give again the call for prayer. I need all of the, our congregants that are here 
to go downstairs. We're only going to have two rows here and everyone is going to go downstairs. Make the accommodations against the volunteers downstairs. We're going to end with this question, but after the prayer, please do stay. We have the calligraphy, we have the info booth. Afterwards, he's going to be here, Brother Kareem is going to be here to answer any other questions. We have a whole bunch of index cards. Again, we only expect 10 people to be here. We got 500. So again, we'll end with this and uh, the call of prayer. And parking. For those waiting on parking, be patient. We're hoping we can wrap this up and that will be cleared up soon. Thank you. Right now, uh, so the question that was asked, I'm just going to, I will just add to the wonderful answer about the passages that speaks about fighting in the Quran. It's very important for us to know, just like there are passages in the Old Testament that deals with fighting in the context of war, there are passages in the Quran to fight in the context of war. Very, very important. And anyone can abuse any passage from the Old Testament or the New Testament. May that be the groups which are fighting up there. May that be KKK. May that be the Jim Jones. May that be the Baruch Goldstein. May that be the HRSS. May that be the Buddhist Khans for abusing their faith and committing atrocities. They don't speak for their faith and definitely the misguided groups that do not speak for Islam. Before we go down, just a correction. Hopefully, I didn't misstate it. But when we call the, 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 the call for prayer, you guys are more than welcome to stay where you are. You can hear it, and then you can watch this prayer as well. So, just for the record, hopefully, I didn't mistake that. Sorry. Second, second, very, very important. Uh, Muslims in the USA, we are not angels, but when it comes to the statistics, we are one of the most uh, peaceful people in the USA. When it comes to the educational level of Muslims, when it comes to the charity that we give, when it comes to the crime rate that we have, uh, the, one of the least divorce rates that we have, Muslims are one of the model societies in the USA. In fact, according to the FBI, from, from 1985 to 2000, Muslims committed the least acts of terrorism in the USA. Number one. Number two, according to the Washington Post, there were 265, 365 acts of violence or mass shootings in the USA last year. Only three of them, when I say only three, every single one of them, we should cry for it. Every single loss of blood is sacred, we should cry for it. Only three were attributed to the Muslims out of the 365. It appears sometimes that Muslims are the only ones committing atrocities because of the wall-to-wall -wall coverage the media sometimes does when a Muslim commits a crime. Number three, and I'm going to end with this is, for every action, there is a cause. So when we see some misguided people, what they are doing in the Middle East, we should not just condemn them Condemnation is not enough, by the way. We also have to look at the cause. And when we ask them the question, how come you're doing what you're doing, many of the time they have a lot of grievances. They have a lot of anger because some of their loved ones have been killed by the drone missiles. Maybe the foreign policies are instilling dictators and supporting the dictators over there. So all of these things are having a, a, a mindset of fear and anger and vengeance that leads to violence. So not only the Muslims have a job to play in reduce what is going on up there, all of us, by exerting our, our uh, effort on the foreign policies to make them much more even-handed. So that would be, I would say, a very important way that all of us could contribute to lessen the effort up there. And so all of us are involved, not just the Muslims in there, inshallah. Thank you so much. So really quickly, I, I know there is... Uh, someone one may allow me. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I've done these things for decades, and there, there are incidents like these that just, at times you wonder if you're making any difference. You know, but, but then you have these inspiring moments. This young lady, this young lady, next to me. She comes up to me and she just brought me to tears. I told her, why don't you convey what you told me to the rest of the audience? Oh, thank you so much. This is really not what I meant to do, but 
I just wanted to say that if I meet this wonderful man's daughter on the street, you can rest assured that I would look in her eyes and give her a hug and she would know that I would see who she is because to me that's the most beautiful part of life and that's my religion to look at someone and see what's in their heart and share with them. Is that what I said? Perfect. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is your America. This is our America. This is our humanity. May the Lord bless you, my, uh, my young lady. And, and, and this is for you uh, about Shirley. We were on the phone together. Uh, she just recently suffered a stroke, so keep her in your prayers. And she was mentioning near the tail end of our conversation, she's like, I, I, I can't pronounce your name. You know, and so I said, just call me Sal, call me, call me Cousin Sal. And she was like, okay, I'll see you on Saturday, cuz. I was like, she is so cool, I can't wait to move meet her. So again, now we're going to make the call for prayer. We need everyone to be seated, and uh, go ahead. Whoa.